Wayne, you've got to warn me before you do those kind of talks. I love Wendell Berry, and I love that poem, uh, The Piece of Wild Things. I have read it many, many times. It's brought me solace. Um, we're talking about In Between Spaces. We kicked it off last week. We're going to wrap up the conversation for now this week. It is far from complete. Uh, underneath this screen is our banner here for inquiry, open inquiry, asking questions. And one of those questions and, those, and the way that we ask those questions is asking in such a way that we don't have to accept or know or be comfortable with the answers or whether the answers will come at all. And in your bulletin, I'm listed, I believe, as the lead teacher. We've, we've already kind of talked in the last week or so. Uh, me as a communicator, how that, that word is, is a little, or that title is a little difficult sometimes to wear because I don't feel that in some things that I have much to teach, but I can tell you about places that we've been. And on this particular topic, on this particular subject of being in in-between spaces, in this land between, I want to talk this morning about breaking open and what our lives are like when we go through these in-between spaces. I can't guarantee you that I'm going to teach you anything you didn't know, but what I can promise you is that together as we think about these in-between spaces and what it's like, that we can grow and encourage one another. Um, Jared mentioned beforehand his wife being home, and interestingly, that's, uh, we share a lot of commonalities, not just in our former employment in evangelical America, but our wives both have uh, and struggled with uh, long-haul COVID. And that alone is a huge thing to try to reorient your life around. My, my wife's not here this morning, and quite frequently she'll have really, really good days and then some other days that are just not so good. And learning to live with that tension and learning to live in that in-between space and that uncertainty is how we grow and I believe that in the process of breaking open, that we can prepare ourselves for more. I want to recap. We talked a little bit last week about liminal space um, and uh, the definition here that we're working with is liminal comes from this uh, Latin word limen, which means threshold. It's a crossing over. As we discussed in pre-talk this morning, it doesn't always happen with a hard and fast line. Sometimes it does. It's the phone call, the diagnosis, the divorce papers being served. There are those times when it's very, very stark that we're entering a new season. But more often than not, it's this slow, gradual process. And one day you kind of look around and you're like, oh, everything's changed. Everything's different now. It's also where we get this word limbo and being stuck in between. Kate Bowler, who I quoted last week there, we, we talked about this book Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. I recommended that to a couple people and gave some uh, links out last week. I love her approach to it. And she said, I secretly love the idea that everything has a purpose and that maybe everything happens for a reason because there gives you, you can have a little bit of a confidence in thinking that there is a plan for this seemingly senseless tragedy or this very, very difficult situation that you find yourself in. There's a name for that with, uh, for uh, a very positive outcome within branches of Christianity called the prosperity gospel. And at one point in my past, I was raised in some of the prosperity gospel doctrine and teachings, which on its surface, to anybody who's not lived it, seems bizarre that you can just uh, have enough faith and receive healing. But when you're in the middle of it, there is a confidence, a comfort in knowing that something is going to come if you just work hard enough at it, if you just pray more, if you have more faith, if you have more belief. And at times in my life, I fully believed that the solution to moving forward was somehow lying in me doing more, being more, changing in some way until I realized that this is a process that we all go through and that we all live through. But unfortunately, people who have not gone through these land-between spaces or these in-between times in their life oftentimes don't know how to connect with others who are going 
through difficult times. Kate talks about how she had stage, a stage four cancer diagnosis and all the things that people said, and anybody in here who's ever had a cancer diagnosis or lost a loved one has heard some of the horrendous things that people have said to you in the name of trying to comfort you and encourage you. I love this card which says, please let me be the first to punch the next person who tells you that everything happens for a reason. On the bottom, I'm sorry you're going through this. That's probably more accurate to how we live. The first noble truth of Buddhism is that there is suffering in life. Life is permeated with difficulties, hardships, and tragedies. It is a part of life. But we don't really need to be taught that, do we? Because we know from a very young age that, that bad things happen and that the first time that we put our hand on the stove or the first time that we got corrected at school or embarrassed, we learn that, that life is full of a lot of, a lot of difficulties. Uh, I, I've raised two girls, uh, Chloe and Emily. This is my oldest, Chloe. Um, this was in 2008. We went camping in West Michigan with my brother and his family, and our kids were, were young. To give you a little bit of a picture between how my two girls are, I said that we wanted to get pictures while we were camping and stuff. So I asked Chloe to get up on the fence post there and snap a picture, and being a dutiful firstborn, she did that. My uh, next child, Emily, I asked her to get up there and take the same picture, <laughs> and we have about 20 or 30 pictures like these of anything but what we wanted her to do, which is just sit there and smile. She has so much character. I love her so much. We were in that same camping trip doing some cooking and making the, uh, the hobo dinner over the uh, campfire, right, where you take the aluminum foil and you put your potatoes and different things in there. And uh, we were making this. This is my daughter, again, being a dutiful firstborn, making sure that everything was wrapped properly and put on the on there, and we were eating it, and you can probably guess what happened just by looking at this picture. So my youngest daughter, Emily, was there, and I, I was looking through these pictures just this week, and I was chuckling to myself as I remember the story because I'd forgotten. Uh, in the corner of the table, you may see that, that jar of Tabasco sauce, and then you may see that we have a water bottle and some towels, and we're trying to flush out her eyes. And, and what had happened was that she had tried to make some food, and she had gotten so excited and got her hands all and everything like that and rub her eyes and immediately began to go hysterical, right? Kids know that bad things happen intuitively. We don't have to teach this. We, yet we forget how prevalent tragedy and difficulty is in life. And it seems that the older we get, the less well we do at going through difficult things. My dear daughter Emily, by that afternoon, as soon as we cleared out, I mean, the, the world had ended and she was crying and screaming. 20 minutes later, she's off playing and laughing and being goofy again. That's life, isn't it? We go through these things over and over and over. What changes is how we respond to it. What we can learn from the dukkha, the principle of suffering, that first noble truth, that there is suffering in the world, and that suffering, that difficulty has things to teach us if we let it. Barbara Brown Taylor said in her book, I've learned things in the dark that I never could have learned in the light. I've learned things in the dark that I never could have learned in the light. So therefore, I, I've come to the realization that the darkness is as necessary for me as the light. The land between is as necessary as it is painful. It has things to teach us. So how do we get through these difficult times? How do we get through these, these transitions? This is where I feel the inadequacy of the title teacher, because I would love to be able to give you Five steps for going through difficult things. I'd love to be able to tell you three principles that if you follow these things, that your next difficulty doesn't have to crush you. But the reality is, I can tell you, not as a teacher, but as someone who has gone through difficult things and continues to go through difficult things and continues to live in this limbo, this in-between state that is life, that there is no single answer and that there are way more questions than there are answers in life. I would say that the best advice 
I love comes from Antonio Machado, a Spanish poet, who said, Traveler, there is no path. Your footsteps are the road and nothing more. There is no path. The path is made by walking. Your path through your in-between space is yours to walk. The steps you take are yours alone. Another way that we have described this in, in our family, my wife and I through the years, is, is the expression of building the bridge as you walk on it. And that's really what a lot of this in-between time feels like, right? When you go through these transitions and you don't know how you're going to emerge on the other side or what part of you is going to emerge on the other side, when you're in the middle of that divorce that is just wrecking you financially and emotionally and physically, and it seems like the bad news just doesn't stop coming. There's not easy solutions for that. Traveler, the path is made by walking. Sometimes the most daring, bold, and audacious thing that we can do is simply to take the next step. Sometimes it is just waking up in the morning and saying, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. It's giving ourselves the grace and the patience to say that what we go through doesn't have to define us, but that the difficulties we face have things to teach us if we let them. Uh, in your bulletin, I, I mentioned a few quotes. The, the first one is from Alan Watts. And one thing you'll get to know about me uh, in my teachings is I'm a huge Alan Watts fan. Fanboy would probably be the best way to describe it. Because I feel about him the same way that I do about Star Wars and other types of geeky genres. I'm a true Alan Watts geek. I've listened to so many talks of his. And he has a book called The Wisdom of Uncertainty. We uh, talked a little bit about that uh, in the pre-talk beforehand. He says this. He says, the desire for security and the feeling of insecurity are the same thing. To hold your breath is to lose your breath. A society based on the quest for security is nothing more than a breath retention contest in which everyone is as taut as a drum and as purple as a beat. And of course, while I'm reading that, I, I'm picturing or, or hearing Alan Watts in his great uh, literary English accent saying that the idea that Holding on to things is the opposite of what we need to do. Does not become more evident until you are in a place where you don't have any other options. And we think that by holding on to our breath, just because we don't know when our next breath is going to come from, we think will provide us with a sense of security. And all it does is try to cling to who we were just a few seconds before instead of realizing that the process of breathing is not just the next breath that comes in, but it's also emptying your breath out. We go through times in life, these seasons, where we have growth and things are coming together and things are good and we have new friendships and new things and new communities and we're so excited and then we also go through other seasons where it seems like systematically things are going to be are being taken away from us one after the other after the other. The things that we clung to as a way of giving us a sense of purpose and security start to fall apart and it's easy to become unraveled in the midst of that. Elizabeth Lesser in her book Broken Open which is such a good book that speaks to these ideas that we're talking about. The idea that when we break open from the tragedies and the difficulties that we, that we go through, that we emerge on the other side with something we didn't have to begin with. She says, how strange it is that the nature of life is change, yet the nature of human beings is to resist change. How ironic that the difficult times we fear might ruin us are the very ones that can break us open and help us to blossom into who we were meant to be. I've been through times and seasons in my life where the next statement I would add 
would be to tell you to trust God, to have faith that everything happens for a reason. And that verse that I have quoted for so many years and I've known, which is Romans 8.28, that I think I have such a complex relationship with now on the other side of it. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. That was one of those first verses that in my deconstruction began to kind of ring hollow for me. Because I'd observed people with the best of hearts and the best of intentions try to encourage someone to encourage someone with that verse. Everything has a plan. It's all good. God's got it all under control. And I do get the appeal of that. We were talking about that in pre-talk too. There is an appeal to someone telling you that it's all going to be okay. That there is someone who knows what's going on and that you don't have to worry. All you have to do is trust. I get it. I get it. I really do. But maybe like me, as you've been on this journey and as you're starting to systematically take things that you were taught and to look at them with fresh eyes, maybe for you, you could look at times and things in your life where you could say there was no purpose whatsoever for this tragedy. It was terrible, and that's enough to say that it was awful. What's happening in Palestine right now doesn't need a purpose, doesn't need a God to provide a plan for it in order for it to make sense because there's nothing that makes sense about that level of tragedy on that scale. This was something that I began to unpack early on in my deconstruction, but it, it left me with this hollowness of, okay, if God doesn't have this plan for me, this predictive plan, this map, that if I follow steps A, it's going to lead me to B and lead me to C, and I'm going to keep progressing. If that's not there, what do I do with this suffering, this dukkha, this, this suffering that permeates life and existence, this thing that we go through over and over and over in our journeys? And I've, I've come to the conclusion that while there is no path through pain that someone can give you that is going to either make sense of that tragedy or somehow predict the outcome, what we do know is this, that because life is pain and because life is suffering, we can draw together and find community with others who are going through that at the same time. That's why the best thing you could say to a person who's lost a loved one, who's gotten a terminal cancer diagnosis or anything like that, is not these words of encouragement that you think is going to help lift their spirits, but perhaps the thing that you just need to say is, it sucks and I'm sorry. Period. But for us, as we go through these things, and this is why I'm encouraged about this community, because we have a depth of story. We have a depth of history within this community. This community is 150 years of change and transition, many of them painful for those of you who lived through some of those experiences. They weren't all sunshine and roses. And yet, here we are. We still emerge on the other side. I want to show a little video here. Um, this is from the 2018 Olympics. And uh, one of the things I hate is when companies I despise just make these amazing emotional marketing videos and commercials. And I'm like, damn it, I hate you, but I really, really love this video. So this is one of these videos from Procter & Gamble. So just ignore the fact that it's Procter & Gamble. This is not a, uh, an endorsement of them or anything like that they're doing to our, our planet. But the message of this video, uh, the first time I heard it, just resonated with me so much because 
you see the stories in the eyes of the children and you recognize if you are aware of the pain that's ahead. And this music that's the backdrop for it is such a perfect song. Unfortunately, we're going to mute it for the live stream. So anybody that's watching on our live stream will post a link to this uh, commercial later on in the notes. But we'll show this short uh, little commercial, and then I want to wrap up afterwards here. Uh, this is a video uh, commercial. It was aired during the 2018 Olympics. Pass around the Kleenex after that one there, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. There's something about that video that rings true because maybe you've had a mom or a dad or a mentor that has been that for you. Maybe not, okay? But we perhaps, if we're, if we're lucky, we've had somebody in our lives who has seen us and who we were going to be before we could see it ourselves. We've had someone like a mom who could look at the child and see the unbridled excitement and joy and optimism for a world that is going to crush them and beat them down. And yet, there's a story to be told on the other side. So friends, whatever your in-between space in that you are in, and we are full of that in our lives. Our lives are full of times of transition. May you have someone in your life that can see you and can encourage you, not with words of platitude that everything's going to be okay, but that can simply walk through that with you. I want to leave you with this admonition in the form of like a benediction, and that word may be loaded for some of you, but it simply means the words of encouragement. It simply means to speak truth or to speak encouragement. And so may these words here be the encouragement for you. It comes from Elizabeth Lesser's book. May you listen to the voice within the beats even when you are tired. May you feel yourself breaking down. When you feel yourself breaking down, may you break open instead. May every experience in life be a door that opens your heart, expands your understanding, and leads you to freedom. If you are weary, may you be aroused by passion and purpose. If you are blameful and bitter, may you be sweetened by hope and humor. If you are frightened, may you be emboldened by a big consciousness far wiser than your fear. If you are lonely, may you find love. May you find friendship. If you are lost, may you understand that we are all lost and still we are guided by strange angels and sleeping giants, by our better and kinder natures, by the vibrant voice within the beat. May you follow that voice, for this is the way, the hero's journey, the life worth living. 
the reason that we are here. Namaste.